they're just like us. Why would we follow someone like that? They couldn't explain him, so they rejected him. Many times in our witness to others, people are going to reject our testimony because they don't know Jesus. Maybe they've been going through a rough time. Maybe things haven't gone quite the way they planned, so they think, well, God has just forgotten us. Or maybe God or Jesus doesn't even exist. We need to go to them and continue to plant seeds. No matter how small a seed we plant, keep planting those seeds. Keep spreading the word. Jesus went back to Nazareth. We need to likewise go back to those that are rejecting our testimony. The second group, the unbelief of his enemies. You expect his enemies those who don't follow Jesus, to reject him. After Jesus goes to Nazareth, Nazareth, he continues with his circuit. He goes on to other villages. He gathers up the twelve and pairs them up. Jesus sends the apostles to witness. In Mark 6, 7, Jesus is going to send out the 12, the 12 apostles, not all of, all of his followers, just these 12. Now, the Greek word for sin is apostello. That gives us our word in English for apostle. Someone sent on a special commission to represent another individual or group and do their work, <coughs> continue their work. That literally defines the apostles and what they do. Continuing in Mark 6, 7 through 9. And he called the twelve to himself and began to send them out two by two and gave them power over unclean spirits. <coughs> he commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bag, no bread, no copper in their money belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. Can you imagine going out on a mission trip with basically what you're wearing now? No luggage, no coat, no money, no visa card, just you and your faith. Well, that's basically what Jesus has done here. He sent them out in their faith. Jesus knew that there was going to be who of some who rejected the apostles. He knew, so he gave them additional instructions. As we continue to read in Mark 6, 10 and 11. Also he said to them, in whatever place you enter a house, stay there till you depart from that place. And whoever will not receive you nor hear you, when you depart from there, shake off the dust under your feet as testimony against them. Assuredly, I say to you, I will be more tolerant for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Jesus knew that there was going to be some great success in this mission trip that he was sending these apostles on. But he also knew there was going to be those who didn't accept. Those who wouldn't listen to them. Those who wouldn't even give them the time of day. So he advised them. Shake off the dust on your shoes, boots, sandals. Move on. Move to the next village or town or individual, but not before making the attempt. Start by offering up your testimony. If they won't listen, they totally reject you, move on. The sad truth is the judgment for those will definitely have its consequences. Not everyone will accept your witness today just as they rejected the witness in those days and times. We need to just continue to drop those seeds. The gospel was then rejected by Herod. Now Jesus would come before Herod Antipas 
before Pilate actually sent him to be crucified. This is the same Herod that rejects this gospel. The gospel isn't brought to him by Jesus. It was actually brought to him by John the Baptist. John the Baptist goes to him and he is preaching repentance. Mark 6, 16 through 18. Herod hears what Jesus is doing and thinks this is John the Baptist arisen from the dead. But when Herod heard, he said, this is John whom I beheaded. He has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. Because John had said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Mark gives us a recounting of how John came to meet his demise. Herodias plots against John because she doesn't like the fact that he's telling Herod that you shouldn't have married him. You should not have taken your brother's wife. So she sets up this scheme with her daughter. Her daughter goes and dances for the king some lewd dance which pleases him and he promises her anything she wants. Herodias has already told her what to ask for. The head of John. Herod did not want to kill John the Baptist. We're told as much in Mark 6.20 for Herod feared John knowing that he was a just and holy man and he protected him and when he heard him he did many things and heard him gladly. But he didn't heed them. John preached to him. He talked to him. He told him what he was doing was wrong. And Herod said, I'm going to do it anyway. Sound like anyone you know? He preached repentance. And Herod did not heed. The third group, this is the group that surprises us. The unbelief of his disciples. Now, as I begin this section, when I say the unbelief, I'm not talking about rejection like Herod or like the people of Nazareth. This is people whose faith was not where Jesus wanted it to be. They didn't trust in Jesus like they should. We're going to look at two instances that show us that their level of faith wasn't where Jesus wanted it. The first was the feeding of the 5,000. Once again, Jesus is followed by a multitude. In this case, about 5,000 are present. Jesus teaches the entire day away. Then in Mark 6, 35 through 37, it says, When the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and already the hour is late. Send them away, that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. But he answered and said to them, You give them something to eat. And, he said, and they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? His disciples see a problem and they come to Jesus and say, what should we do here? <coughs> they offer up either we need to send them home, let them fend for themselves, or we're going to have to buy 200 denarii worth of bread. 200 denarii at this time is approximately a year's wage for the average person. Are they going to spend money that they don't have on food for people? Thousands of people. <coughs> they look at things much like the ideal committee member might look at them. Someone wants to find the committee as a group of people who individually can do nothing and collectively decide that nothing can be done. <laughs> Unfortunately, I participated in some of those committees. <laughs> Jesus looked at the situation not as a problem 
but as an opportunity, an opportunity to trust in the Father and glorify his name. Our first step in a situation should not be to measure our resources, but to determine God's will in that situation and trust in him to meet that need. According to John 6, it is Andrew that finds the boy with the lunch and brings it to Jesus. Continuing in Mark 6, 41 through 44. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fish he divided among them all. So they ate and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of fragments and of the fish. Now those who had eaten the loaves were about 5,000 men. Now we refer to this as the feeding of the 5,000. Back then, it was not traditional to count women and children when they're in a group, just the men. So this group could have been 10, 15,000 people. We don't know. The exact number isn't what's important here. What's important is that the disciples had the opportunity to trust. And Jesus, rather than sending the people home or out into the wilderness to fend for themselves, rather than setting up a fund to be page to feed 5,000, he went to God. And God blessed that food and it fed over 5,000 people. The next event is the stilling of the storm. The meal is over. The teaching is done for the day. Jesus tells the multitude that it's all done. We're leaving. And he tells the disciples to get in a boat and go across to Genesaret, across the Sea of Galilee. But he doesn't go with them. Now, why would Jesus send these 12 across and not go with them? Well, there's a couple of reasons. For one, the people were getting restless. <clears throat> they wanted to make Jesus their king. And we'll read about that in John 6 14 and 15. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him and forced to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. So he sends the 12 across the sea by themselves and he goes off to pray. Now the disciples are still thinking along earthly terms. Just like those people, they want to make Jesus their king. They think along earthly lines, as we saw in the dividing of the food for the 5,000. So Jesus sends them, and this is the second reason, he sends them into a storm to build their faith, to test their faith once again. They have just come off this mission trip that was very successful. <coughs> They fed 5,000 people. They were there. They witnessed it. And now they're on something of a spiritual high, and they go in this boat and run into a storm. We church, as God's people, are in a storm right now. This earthly storm surrounds us very similar to what occurs in the church in the book of Acts. On the day of Pentecost, thousands come to Christ and then the church begins to face persecution. We're in the midst of persecution. Persecution is going to be around us all the time. But Jesus is in glory interceding for us. If we get in a storm, he will be there with us to make sure that we reach that far shore just as he does in this scripture, Mark 6, 48 through 52. Then he saw them straining and roaring, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea, and would have passed them by. 
And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost, and they cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he went up into the boat to them, and the wind ceased, and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marvel. For they had not understood about the loaves, because their hearts were hardened. Jesus comes to them on the stormy sea. He looks like he's going to go right on past them. They even think it's his ghost rather than Jesus. But then he comforts them. He tells them not to be afraid. He gets in the boat and the winds die. All is good. Now, there's a part of the story that you may say, well, isn't something missing there? How about Peter? Didn't he get out of the boat and walk on the water? He did. But you might remember when we started this series, I described this book, and many theologians described it as the gospel of Peter as told to or interpreted by Mark. If that's true, then perhaps Peter didn't want to put that in there because he didn't want to seem boastful. I walked on water. How about you? At the same time, perhaps he didn't want to be criticized for sinking, for taking his eyes off Jesus. I don't know for sure, but that's one reason that it may not be listed in here. The point is, would they have gotten out of the boat. Would you, we, get out of the boat and try to walk on the water going to Jesus? Where is our faith? The disciples had taken their eyes off Jesus. Their faith wasn't there like Jesus would later build it up to. Where is your faith? As we now come to our time of invitation, if you haven't had Jesus come into your life, if you haven't accepted him as your personal Savior, you can do that today. If you have accepted Jesus as your personal Savior, if he is Lord of your life, and you're here as a visitor, and you're wanting to find a place to make your church home. You can do that today. You can come forward and become a member of this church body. Third, if you have a prayer need that you want me or one of the elders to pray with you about, the elders are in the back. They haven't moved around with me this week. You can do that as well. If any of these three things meet your needs today, I invite you to come forward as we now stand and sing our hymn of invitation. The Savior is waiting for us 329.
fellowship dinner, bring food, I'm already hungry. <laughs> Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this time we've been able to share together. Thank you for the book of Mark, the lessons that we glean from Mark. May we take them into the world. May we plant seeds everywhere we go. Lord, bless this day. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.